Thank you, choir. It's a joy and a privilege for me to introduce to you our chapel speaker for this morning, my wife, Pam Beebe. Absolutely. Although this is not a venue she typically enjoys, I always enjoy getting to hear her speak. She's an incredible wife, incredible mother, trained counselor, a friend, a Kapok Day leader, a fan of Westmont basketball. <laughs> and in so many ways, a source of great emotional strength and well-being for our family and for you. Pam was born and raised in the greater Portland area. She went to George Fox University where she earned her undergraduate degree in teaching and her graduate degree in counseling. She is a remarkable person, a friend of mine, not just a friend of others. One of her dear friends who is here this morning often refers to her as Switzerland. Everything goes in, but nothing comes out. I especially enjoy hearing her talk about her Kapok Day group. She never shares names, but she always shares the personalities. And it reminds me so much of the days when we were working together in grief recovery. She is a great grief recovery counselor. And she would come home from these grief recovery workshops, share with me what had gone on, and then fall totally to sleep. And I would stay up the rest of the night worrying about the problem of evil and suffering in the world. <laughs> when, she come, when I come home and I hear about the Kapak Day uh, group, I just think, I am just so thankful that people like my wife are available to you during these incredible periods of life when so many great things are happening, but you're also having the opportunity in many cases for the first time in your life to process some of the big issues that you face. More than anything, uh, what I love about Pam uh, is the way that she's always emotionally present to me, to our family, and to anyone who's with her. Would you please join me in welcoming our chapel speaker, Pam Beebe. Well, it is great to be with you this morning. And thank you, honey, for a very sweet introduction. I'm very fortunate to be married to him, don't you think? <laughs> And we are very fortunate to be able to serve as your presidential couple. You know, um, you absolutely bring us so much joy and truly, truly inspire us. We sometimes have to pinch ourselves because we can hardly believe that our earthly assignment has included working with college students and specifically this group of college students, so we're thrilled. Well, today is February 29th. It is a date that only comes around once every four years, that means that this is a leap year, and today specifically is called Leap Day. So I've decided it would be very appropriate for me to invite you to take a leap with me this morning. And not just any leap, but a leap into some very deep water. Some of you may have come to Westmont because of its proximity to the ocean. So the idea of jumping into deep water might sound very easy and very cool to you. And you might say, no problem. Because for you, images like this might come to mind. <laughs> but if you're anything like me, I prefer to gaze at deep water, water uh, as opposed to be in it. I love to sit on the sand in the hot sun and watch others play in the ocean. I love to exercise along the boardwalk. I love to go on romantic dinners with an ocean view. Um, but I do not like to be in deep water myself because it's cold, it's over my head, it's out of my comfort zone, and I'm just convinced that there are scary creatures swimming down underneath me ready to attack me. <laughs> I'd like to uh, wait a few minutes before I give you your leaping instructions. Um, and I'd like to talk with you about the spiritual significance 
of water in the Bible. Water literally thro flows through all the pages of scripture from the very beginning to the end. It is referred to 722 times, which is less than Jesus and God and heaven and love, but more than faith, hope, joy, prayer, community, worship. So, so God really uses water in the scripture. And I want to tell you about just a few of those uses. This is not a comprehensive list. The first way that God, is, that God uses water in scripture can be seen in the very opening scene of the Bible, where God's spirit is brooding over the waters of the deep. And then God says, let the waters bring forth life. So the first use of water I want to draw your attention to is the fact that it brings forth life. Secondly, in the book of Exodus, we have the story of the people of Israel fleeing from Egypt and Pharaoh's armies. And what happens? They come to the Red Sea. And God parts the Red Sea to rescue and deliver his people. So, God, so water is used in the Bible to rescue and deliver. It is also used to purify and cleanse John the Baptist in the gospel is baptizing people for repentance. There's a precedent for when Jesus comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So people are coming to the Jordan River, confessing their sins, repenting, and they are being cleansed. It is also used to heal many, many times in the Old and New Testament. Specifically in John 9, the, the blind man comes to Jesus asking to be healed. And Jesus said, go and bathe and dip in the pool of Siloam, and you will be healed. And he is. So water is used to heal. And the last one I want to highlight for you this morning is water is also used to bless. Jesus, in his very first miracle at the wedding of Cana, uh, turns water into wine. And that is a blessing for those who are there. For this morning's purposes, I would like to tell you a gospel story about deep water where God uses water to demonstrate his power and provision. So if you have your Bibles with me this morning, you can join me in turning to Luke 5, 1 to 11. It's a very familiar story. And if you don't have your Bibles, let me set the stage for you. Jesus is teaching the crowds at the Sea of Galilee, and the crowds are pressing in. We know that this is a very popular time in his ministry where people are flocking to him. He looks beside him, and he sees two fishing boats and a group of fishermen who are washing their nets. He steps into one of the boats and asks the owner, Simon Peter, to push him out a little from the shore, where he finishes teaching the people about the word of God. And when he is done teaching the people, he says to Simon Peter, I want you to launch out into deep water. Peter looks at him and says, Master, we have been fishing all night, and we have not caught a thing. But because you're asking me to do it, we will do it. And Peter and his companions launch their fishing boats into deep water, and they put down their nets for a catch. What we know about this story is droves of fish came into those nets to the point where the nets began to break. And Peter now realized that he was in, in the presence, likely of a divine being. And he falls on his knees, says, Lord, go away from me. I am a sinner. And Jesus says, fear not. From now on, you will catch men. And they left everything, and they followed him. For our purposes this morning, I want us to specifically look at the portion of the story where Jesus asked Peter to launch out into the deep water. Now think about this with me. Peter must have been full of skepticism and doubt because he had just been out in those same waters all night long and had not caught a thing. He knows the fish are not biting, at least in that spot. He also knows that he himself is a skilled fisherman. This is what he does for a living. Doesn't know very much about this guy named Jesus, but clearly he doesn't look like a fisherman. In fact, he was a carpenter's son. But Peter made the decision 
probably was inspired to obey, and he headed out into deep water, and because of his willingness to obey, he got to see God's power and provision demonstrated. He got to experience a miracle. I would like to propose to you this morning that I think that God is asking each one of us to launch out into deep water in some aspect of our lives. And I can guarantee you that it's going to be something that's over your head. It's going to be out of your comfort zone. It's going to be something that your own skills, abilities, and talents cannot accomplish on your own. And it will absolutely require trusting Jesus. But if you do that, you will experience his power and provision and have the opportunity to witness the miracle. I'd like to share with you about a couple of deep experiences from my own life, deep water experiences in my own life. The first one is related to my upbringing. Um, I was fortunate to be born into a family with a mom and dad who loved each other and loved God. My dad worked for a Christian organization similar to this one. My mom was home most of my younger years before she became a teacher. We lived on a little, what I call, I call it a hobby farm. It was five acres. My mom and dad had the opportunity to build their own home, which was a modest, not lavish, but comfortable for our family of six. I had three brothers. We had a Shetland pony, a donkey, two steers, and a milk cow. And I had the privilege of milking the cow morning and evening uh, during my uh, growing up years. Sometime in grade school, I've been told that my dad walked out into our little corn patch, the cornfield on one of our acres of land, was reflecting on his life. And he realized that our, we were living in a Christian bubble, working for a Christian organization, and um, very involved in ministry at our church. And he couldn't even think of a person uh, that did not know the Lord that he had a significant relationship with. And so he said a prayer at that time, and he said, Lord, I want to be used by you in a more significant way. I want to touch the world for Christ. I don't know how to do that, but I'm just going to offer you my life. It was not long after that that my parents began opening their home to people who had a need. You just needed a place to stay and a warm meal. Um, at first, it was really fun. We had some college students come for a short period of time. We had a youth minister come who needed board and room. And then, uh, as I was later in grade school, about sixth grade, my parents decided to invite a boy who had been tossed around in the foster care program, had not had a lot of success, was very wounded, and he came to live with us, entering my grade in sixth grade and stayed with me through high school. We also had distant relatives that were really struggling to come and live with us. We had Viet Vietnamese refugees. We had other adolescents from really rough backgrounds. We had those who were struggling with addictions. And we even had some who were homeless. And in a 10-year period of time, there were 26 individuals that rotated through our home, anywhere from weeks to months to years. This was a deep water experience for my mom and dad. They did not have the resources to pull this off on their own. Certainly, they did not have the financial resources to put food on the table every night for an unlimited amount of people, or even beds in the house. But somehow, God's provision was always there. They also did not have the resources emotionally or psychologically to deal with the woundedness that came in our home. But they were willing to put themselves out there and to follow God's call and they experienced his power and provision and sustenance in their own life, but they also got to witness the growth and the progress and the miracles in those that came into our home. Well, my deep water experience was connected to this, um, but it was slightly of, of a more personal nature. Usually when people were rotating through our home, um, it wasn't a problem for me. But occasionally, when somebody that my parents were helping was close to my own age, um, sometimes it became complicated and difficult for me. 
And especially towards the end of this period of time when my mom and dad were ministering this way, there's an individual that they begin to help that out of his own uh, emotional instability needed kind of a target for his anger. And I kind of became that person for a couple years. And I found myself in college a little later, in the middle of my college experience, feeling pretty wounded. And those wounds manifested themselves in some deep, unresolved anger. Well, one of the things uh, that I remember so clearly is the day, uh, well, first of all, I need to tell you that how I, how I started dealing with those wounds is I wanted to put them in a compor compartment and ignore them and throw them in the deep recesses of my mind. But what so often is true about wounds that aren't dealt with is they begin permeating every aspect of my life and all of my most significant relationships. I do remember the day when the Holy Spirit literally shouted at me because I know he'd been nudging me for a long, long time and I'd been ignoring him. So I just felt this day he was shouting at me. I remember where I was, when it was, and he said, it is time. It is time to deal with these wounds. It is time to get rid of the stuff in your life so you can become effective for the Lord Jesus. Well, to me, the reason that was a deep water experience is because it felt completely overwhelming and impossible for me to deal with my wounds because it meant repenting from my own sin of self-righteousness and pride. It meant forgiving another. It meant asking for forgiveness. It meant seeking reconciliation. And it meant starting my own healing journey, all of which felt way too much for me to handle. But I do remember that day, mostly because I felt so destroyed by the pain in my life, that I made a decision to obey. Thankfully, I was in a community similar to this one, and I was surrounded with people that could help me. And so often is the case, although God definitely did a work in my life on that particular day, he really chose others to come alongside with me and to take me on that healing journey. And the repentance and the forgiveness and the reconciliation, the healing, it happened. And for me, it honestly has been one of the most profound experiences I have ever had with the Lord. He completely released me from that bondage and re-allowed me to start being fruitful for him again. A verse that meant so much to me during that time and has ever since is 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where Paul hears God saying, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And it was through my weakness that I experienced his power. Now, I don't know what kind of deep water experience the Lord might have for you. You might be more like my parents, where you're in a real stable place in your life, and you might honestly just have a desire or a passion to be used more fully by the Lord. Perhaps that would entail choosing a major that seems impractical, or making a decision about a vocational path or a job that feels really, really risky. It could mean committing to a relationship. Or it could mean breaking up from a relationship. It could mean making a financial decision. It could mean joining a ministry or starting a ministry. For others of you, your deep water experience that God might have for you might be of a more personal nature. You might have come to Westmont with some wounds, or perhaps some wounds have happened since you've been here. I know that you're coming, some of you from broken families, or perhaps you've had a significant breakup in a dating relationship, or perhaps you've been dealing with an illness or a loss, and possibly those wounds have been manifested in anger and anxiety and depression and possibly even, even eating disorders or addiction. Well, what I know and what we've already seen from Scripture is what God's power can offer you is new life, rescue and deliverance, purification and cleansing, healing, 
and certainly an absolutely blessing. So now it is time for your leaping instructions, okay? The first instruction I have for you when you're getting ready to take this leap is you really need to listen to the Lord and pay attention to where in the deep water he wants you to leap. Secondly, make a decision to obey. Have a willing spirit. Be willing to obey. And thirdly, attempt something you cannot do on your own. William Barclay, the great Bible commentator, who I appreciate, says, if you want to see a miracle, you need to take Jesus at his word and attempt to do the impossible. And remember that when Jesus was working with Peter, he asked him to launch out to the, into the deep water in and amongst his own daily life and routine. You don't have to go around the world to do it. Pay attention to what God has put around you. Well, I have some final thoughts for you. The first is, um, don't be a boat potato. I have borrowed this term from John Ortberg, who wrote a wonderful book, If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. And he says, if you don't respond to God's call and get out of the boat, then you're a boat potato, and what you sacrifice is your own growth and God-given potential. And let me tell you that there have been times when I have heard the call and I have been unwilling to obey, and I know that I have sacrificed my own growth. And the absolute highest points in my life have been when I have attempted to do something that I did not have the resources to do on my own. And I had the privilege of experiencing and seeing God's power at work, and I got to view the miracle. Secondly, make sure before, secondly, in terms of my final thoughts, be willing to ask for help. Do you know you have been placed here at Westmont at this unique period in your life. And those of us on the faculty and staff that are here, we have been called to invest in you. And we are so willing, if you come to us, to help you get on this healing path or this path of leaping out into deep water. So you, we just hope that you will really invite us into the process because I don't think that God expects us to leap into deep water on our own. And finally, know that there really is an ultimate plan. When I think back about the deep water experience that I have shared with you, the people rotating through my home those, those, during those 10 years of my life, I have to tell you that that is how God chose to grow in my heart compassion. And then during my own healing journey that happened afterwards where I sought the help of Christian counselors, I actually caught a vision for the importance of healing in a Christian context. Those two things specifically are what really uh, God put before me in helping direct me in my own vocational path. So God doesn't waste anything, no matter what you're going through. Well, let me just conclude by saying it is February 29th. There's an opportunity here today because in the newspaper that I saw this morning, on the front page it said, it's Leap Day, and it is Leap Day. And I just want to invite you to take advantage of this opportunity to really listen to God's call and obey and jump out into that deep water and attempt something you cannot do on your own. Please pray with me. Father, we offer ourselves to you this morning. We are so thankful that you are God and that you are all-powerful and that you invite us to come alongside you and to partner with you in your work in this world. Father, we just pray that we'll have ears to hear when you call. We pray that we will uh, have the courage to be obedient. And Father, we just ask that you work in us and through us to make a difference in this world. We love you. Amen.